I've purchased over 100 animals on Craigslist, consisting of reptiles and amphibians. It sounds pretty excessive, but if you already watched the channel, uh, you know that it's because I co-created a site a few years ago where we would rehabilitate, breed, and sell reptiles and amphibians, and then ship them off to new customers. Our way of kind of building a reputation was by buying animals on Craigslist, uh, watching after them, making sure they're healthy, and then selling them on the site. Now that it's more sustaining with the number of animals that come in, along with breeding projects, but I think I am a pretty reputable person to talk about buying animals on Craigslist since we've probably purchased more than most people. So I'm gonna go over all of my tips and my whole process of buying an animal and my recommendations for you for safely purchasing a pet reptile or amphibian through craigslist.com or similar sites. So let's begin. First off, why are you buying an animal on Craigslist? Uh, there's a handful of reasons. The most common reasons that I hear from people are that they don't have any local reputable places to them. They don't want to get an animal shipped to them. They want to see the animal in person before buying, or they don't want to support a breeder. Instead, they want to buy from someone that has to get rid of it because it's more so rehoming an animal instead of giving money to someone that you might not necessarily support. You might not want to support a chain like Petco or PetSmart. Uh, there's tons of different reasons and these are all valid, but you have to remember Craigslist comes with its handful of issues as well. You can probably guess the most obvious, which is an animal that's either different from what it was described as or something that seems fine. They turns out that it was fine in the moment, but the previous owner was doing something that had long-term effects or issues with the animal. And then finally, maybe it's just a weird person. Maybe you don't want to meet the person, the usual Craigslist stuff. So just make sure you're aware that animals might be different from how they're described, but granted this can happen on any site and it's very common because so many reptile sellers suck so bad. Now that we take in animals from just anyone, we get to hear constant stories from constant sites. We've had animals come from so many different popular sites and just so many negative stories. No company's gonna be perfect, but it's, it's surprising. So I understand where people are coming from with this, but it is risky either way. I'm gonna assume that you already know what you want. I would say just a leopard gecko as an example. And the most obvious thing is you go to Craigslist, you go to your city and you type in leopard gecko. Keep the keywords as simple as possible. Maybe even just do leopard or just do gecko because people misspell everything. You should also spell things different ways to make up for these misspellings. Instead of leopard gecko, say leopard gecko with just a K. Say leopard gecko. Say lizard, leopard lizard, spotted lizard. Some people don't even know what species it is and they might just call it gecko or blizzard or something. So just keep going through all of these keywords and see just how many you can find. What I personally do is save every single one that I'll potentially purchase. It just basically as links in like a document and I don't actually contact them yet. But for leopard gecko, I spell leopard a bunch of different ways. I spell gecko a bunch of different ways. I look at the local area, and then I look at a couple nearby cities. First check community. Most people don't wanna feel like they're selling their animal, so they post it in the community section. But let's face it, most of them are selling their animal, and others will just be aware of that and put it in the for sale section. You can check all the tabs, but there's never any in events or anything like that. Next up, let's say you have a super long list of animals that you are considering. I would say it wouldn't hurt to contact all of them. Uh, now, I do not recommend using your real email or your real phone number. People have different goals. They might try to spam you, scam you. They might just get annoying. And this takes off the reliability of you having to respond to them. Uh, Cause just a disclaimer here, a lot of things that I do on Craigslist are kind of douchey in a lot of ways. And personally, I tend to be that annoying person. If you've ever been on Reddit and you saw Choosing Beggars, that, that subreddit, um, that's basically me on Craigslist. And so I'm gonna be talking about those as just a heads up. You don't have to do everything I'm gonna say, obviously. You might really get on people's nerves and you don't want them having your real number. To get around this, you can use Gmail to make a free email, obviously. And you can use voice.google.com to create a fake phone number. You can also buy a burner phone on Amazon or something with like a cheap temporary SIM card or something. But I recommend just using voice.google. You enter your real number, but it's then masked by this other number. Uh, I almost think of it as like a VPN. The only difference is it doesn't cover up your location. So don't do this if you're doing something illegal. But you can do something kind of similar to a VPN, which is choose your own locate, what's it called? Location, postal code, not postal code. We'll get into why that's possibly useful later on. But once you have all the people in a list, try and keep really organized track of all this to make it easier. Um, Cause even if you're just looking for one personal pet leopard gecko, 
uh, it's, it's good to keep your stuff organized because you might end up mixing up who you're talking to. Because I personally talk to as many as physically possible to find the best choice possible. Most likely they'll have an email as a contact, uh, which will be an auto-generated Craigslist email to protect them, and then their personal phone number. Uh, not everyone adds to this. Uh, other people say just text or just call or just do it within these hours. Personally, I always go for the number first because they're more likely to check their text than their email, uh, and I text them before I do anything else. If they don't respond to that after like six to 24 hours, depending on how desperate I am, I then email them as well. Now, the reason I do so many people is because most people don't even respond. In my experience on the Raleigh and Charlotte and Virginia Craigslist areas, all in North Carolina, kind of like Virginia to South Carolina, because that was kind of my domain on Craigslist, um, I get maybe 50% responses. Even fewer end up actually working out a price with me, even fewer end up setting up a time, even fewer actually drive to the location and meet you there, and even fewer actually have what you expected. So I'd say at the end of everything, I ended up getting maybe one to 2% of the animals that I actually contacted, but I contacted a lot, and I oftentimes did not wanna pay full price that they were asking. So basically, expect people not to reply. If they don't reply, you can always email them again, and you can use a different email or phone number to see if for some reason they maybe ignored you because they didn't like something you said. But the first time you contact them, don't talk about the price, don't do anything, just say, is this still available? To make sure that they actually start talking to you. If you immediately start negotiating with them and uh, it's a price they don't like, that might just ignore you and never respond. But if you just get them to say hello, yes, it's still available, they have a little more accountability on their side to actually follow up and respond. They don't have to. For all you know, they could be using a fake number as well. Hopefully they are for their own protection as well because there's bad buyers too. Um, but still, they feel more inclined to reply when they're already in a conversation. Next up, talking to them, important things to ask. I got to the point where I would just say, hey, is it available? They'd be like, yep, I'd negotiate, I'd get it. No questions asked, I didn't care about the Care, I didn't care about the health of the animal because our goal was to help as many animals as possible and increase our skills when it comes to rehabilitation, working with the malnourished animals, stuff like that. If you're buying a personal pet leopard gecko as our example, you most likely want a healthy one, especially starting out. You don't want to immediately have to rehab an animal when it's your first pet. I would not recommend that. So you want a healthy gecko and that's why you're going to ask questions. Basically, hopefully you've already researched the animal care-wise with a care guide or various care guides online and stuff like that. And you kind of just want to quiz them on this, but keep it short, keep it simple, keep it respectful. And there are different ways to ask questions that make it sound like it's for the benefit of the animal when actually you're just trying to see, like figure out if they're a bad seller or not. For example, something good to ask is, what's the setup like? I wanna try and mimic it as close as possible so that the animal is happy and healthy. The goal here is they'll tell you everything about the setup or at least the basics, and then you know how bad the animal's been cared for. For example, if they tell you the leopard gecko has been on calcium sand, which is probably one of the worst options you could pick if you didn't know, so sorry if you're using calcium sand, it's a bad choice, you instantly know there's a high risk of them having impaction, which means that there's a very high risk that their lifespan is going to be much shorter than average uh, based on our experience. Um, we've gotten a lot of animals that have been on sand and impaction is very common and I highly do not recommend buying one if you have not dealt with this before and don't use sand in general. So uh, other things you can ask are the diet. Maybe they say that it's eating freeze-dried insects. Uh, some people feed their leopard geckos these. I don't recommend it either. Uh, a lot of the nutrients is in that juice of the bug. So maybe it was living off freeze-dried mealworms. There's a chance it'll have malnourishment or be lacking in some sort of vitamin or nutrients. Uh, and that can affect the health of the animal along with its lifespan. Also, make sure you ask for pictures. If there's pictures on the post, it doesn't matter. Reverse image search them, you right click, say search Google for this image, and you'll see if this picture's been posted publicly on the internet before. If it has, most likely it's a stolen image. Now the problem is, a lot of people will steal pictures from other Craigslist listings, wait for those listings to get deleted, and then use those pictures of themselves. So then, if you reverse Google search it, it won't show up because the Craigslist post was already removed. To make up for this, you need to get a new picture from them. Try and make it specific, but not suspicious. Don't be like, can you hold up two fingers? I guess you could do that, and they might be okay with doing that, but I would personally just avoid this and uh, say something like, could you send 
a picture in better light, I'd really love to see what color it is, or I don't know, I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head. Basically, ask for new pictures, and don't be afraid to ask for multiple pictures. If they're too lazy to even send you an image, it's very likely they're gonna be too lazy to show up to the meetup if you end up meeting them. Next up, once you've found someone that's actually replying and actually answered your questions, let's talk about negotiation. I'm gonna go very briefly over this. You can watch this timestamp of this video. I don't know it off the top of my head, so I'd... here it is. I went over my really weird negotiation tactic, um, but it works. Basically, the long story short is you pretend to be lots of different people uh, all at once from different numbers, different emails, talk very differently with different dialects, different tones, uh, different grammar, and first give them a bunch of awful deals that sound just so bad they don't even consider accepting them. Then when you send a decent deal, it's gonna look really good compared to all those awful deals you sent, or more, I guess, not deals, but uh, asking prices. Uh, quick example, if it's $100, send one dumb email that asks $10, that asks if they'll take it for $10, then send another from a different email. Uh, don't make it obvious, you gotta mix it up, you gotta wait in between, maybe even wait a couple days in between, and send them one for 20 bucks. If they don't do that, maybe say 30. And then finally, do a very respectful, very friendly email where you ask 60 bucks or something more reasonable, and then all of a sudden it sounds really good. This is exhausting and time consuming and not necessarily worth the time. You're very much so increasing the chances of getting yelled at, uh, getting sworn at, getting threatened, and just overall being disrespectful because you're pretty much misleading them. I mean, you are kind of, I don't know, who cares? But there's a lower chance you're gonna get the animal if you do this. So if you really want the animal, don't, don't do this tactic because Craigslist has a lot of people looking for stuff, especially animals, and animals disappear super quickly. We got to the point where we would check Craigslist every couple hours all around the clock. Um, because animals would sell within 30 to 60 minutes. And sometimes you gotta be quick. Other times there's listings that have been up for months. I still recommend contacting those people. I still get responses from people that have posted their animal four to six months ago and they immediately respond and they're still ready. It's just something that nobody else wanted or nobody else took their price for or something. So don't let the time sway you from answering, from re contacting them, but just keep in mind it might affect it. But uh, yeah, a lot of things will go up. It'll be posted an hour ago, and there'll already be 10 people trying to get that animal. For that reason, you might not want to pretend to be a bunch of different people and waste that time. So again, I talked about more negotiation stuff in that video, but let's say you found the perfect animal, and it's at a price that you are willing to pay. Say it is $100, and you're willing to pay that $100. Next, it's time to get that animal. Uh, what I'm gonna cover here is driving there, what to do if you're late, because I'm always late, and uh, getting the animal and then leaving. Okay, it's time to set up a location to get your animal. Uh, first off, let's cover if the person requires that you go to their house. As you may know, it's risky to go to someone's house on Craigslist, and it's risky to have them come to your house. If anyone ever said, yeah, I'll give you the animal, I wanna come to your house, don't do that. But if they require that you come to their house, there's a chance that it's safe. And personally, I've been to maybe 50 Craigslist houses or so, and there's some weird houses, but there's never been anything dangerous or risky. Then again, I'm not in a super dangerous area, so keep safety in mind, but I'm gonna cover some things that we do when going to houses. I'm not an FBI officer, I don't know all the safety stuff. This is just what we do. One, don't go by yourself. We've done it, it's been fine. Uh, either I've gone or someone else has gone by themselves, and most of the time the person's just fine and at the most they're kind of weird and the house is pretty sketchy. We've never been in grave danger, but try to bring someone else, um, one to two people with you. So I'll talk about the house thing in a minute, but let's say you're meeting in a center location or a location that's away from their home. Obviously you look for public areas, you can do police stations. We usually do Walmart parking lots, Starbucks parking lots, stuff like that. Uh, somewhere simple and public where there's a lot of people, it's out in the open, it's during the day and uh, there's security. So. We've done tons of pickups at night. We've done them as late as 10 or 11 p.m., uh, sometimes pushing midnight. If people have a second or third shift, maybe they have to wake up at a certain time, go to sleep at a certain time, or they're not available. So just because someone says they want to meet at 11 p.m. at a Walmart doesn't necessarily mean that they want to kill you, but it could. And it's not 100% of people, uh, as I've proven, but 
it's understandable if you're weirded out by that. So I get it if you don't want to go to a dark place because that's weird. You most likely don't want to drive the whole way. Uh, I'm just gonna use some cities in North Carolina as an example. Say I live in Raleigh and the animal is in Asheville, uh, which is west to me. You don't wanna drive all the way to Asheville. That's like a four, three or four hour drive and that's really far. Uh, if, if this person is willing to drive and meet you, let's say they ask to drive halfway uh, because that's fair for both of you. You don't have to actually be honest, you know? I'm not saying you shouldn't be honest, but I'm just saying if you want to save some time, maybe you happen not to live in Raleigh, you actually live in Emerald Isle, which is on the coast. Emerald Isle is like seven hours away. Yeah, let's meet in the middle. The middle of, of Emerald Isle and Asheville. Oh, that's Raleigh. Can you drive to Raleigh? Maybe they'll be like, yeah, maybe they'll be like, that's too far. But if they say yes, you just got a five minute drive and they just got a three hour drive. Um, if you actually meet in the center, then say you meet somewhere in between Asheville and Raleigh, there's nothing wrong with that. And that's about an hour and a half for each of you. Um, but who knows, maybe they're lying about their location too. Maybe they actually live in Raleigh as well. <laughs> I don't know, who knows? Um, maybe you're both doing the trick and then you both get a five minute drive. That'd be kind of funny. But anyway, this is where your phone number ties in. If you want to use a fake number, Google Voice actually lets you pick your area code. So you can just type in that you live in Emerald Isle and then basically that might get suspicious of your area code. Like if you live in Raleigh and your code is like 999, I don't, I don't know what the area code there is. And then you say you're in Emerald Isle, they might be suspicious of that. Personally, we've never had someone suspicious of our number uh, that's never been asked because uh, we've even used California numbers and they just ignore it. So you most likely don't need to do that. But if they get suspicious uh, continually in your area, you could always just change your area code and uh, fix it that way. Just if you wanna fake your location. And then next there's the going to their house. Uh, they might require you that you go to their house because they don't have a car, their car's broken down, uh, they pretend that their car's broken down and they're actually just lazy. Uh, or you're buying supplies that they can't fit in their vehicle. Personally, I've sympathized with that, like, because if you have a small car, you literally just can't fit it to meet. Uh, so they might be like, okay, you have to come pick it up. Also, people are often disabled and they physically can't drive or they physically can't pick up the items that they're bringing. So they'll ask that you come and pick it up uh, and that's the only way you can get it. For house safety, Again, it's not necessarily dangerous just because you're going to their house and we did it every week. We'd always go to a new house, but that doesn't mean that you're gonna be safe necessarily. So here's just our personal protocol we would have. One, if you're going by yourself, always give multiple other people your location that you're going to. Tell them what time you're getting there and what time you'll be back. If I don't call by X, then call the police to this location. Like, okay, I'm going to this house. I'm supposed to meet there at 12. I'll let you know when I get there in the driveway. Uh, if I don't call you by 12.30, then there's something wrong and you need to help me. So get someone reliable that you can do that with. Also, if you're going with somebody, it doesn't hurt to tell someone else that as well. That's not going, but uh, it's more safe if you go with someone as well. Uh, multiple people even, I don't think it's too weird. And not all of them even have to come inside. Like maybe just two of you go inside, two of you wait in the car. If you don't have any friends, I understand. It'll be harder and I would try to avoid going to their house. But what we would do is uh, we don't walk in the house first, they walk in first and we are the one that shuts the door behind us. If there's no animals, we don't even shut the door. We just crack it. We never lock the door. Um, if the person asks that we close it, we close it. If the person asks that you lock it, don't and leave. <laughs> We've never had someone ask us to lock their door. At the most, they'll ask us to close it if they don't want the temperature to change or if they have an animal that might get out. Also, just pay attention to the area when you're driving up to it, see if it seems sketchy. Uh, look for vehicles, see what kind of vehicles they are. Maybe that's being judgmental. I mean, it is being judgmental. Anyone with any vehicle could be dangerous, but uh, it, it helps if there's like a ton of vehicles outside or if there's no vehicles outside. If you drive up to a house with zero vehicles, you should be concerned. Um, <laughs> that's kind of weird. And we actually have done that before. And it was super confusing because they were still texting us and we saw a motion inside the house, but there were no cars outside. But in our experience, when this would happen, it was actually a kid meeting us um, while their parents weren't home. Sometimes it looked like they were hiding something from their parents, like the animal was there without their parents' permission and they were sneaking it out while they weren't home. <laughs> uh, and then other times, I don't know, I guess kids are just going like 
selling whatever they want on Craigslist by themselves. Next, when we walk into the house, we try and kind of survey without being weird as you start the conversation. Usually this is super quick. The whole ordeal might be less than two minutes. Uh, sometimes it's literally 15 seconds for a Craigslist meetup. Other times it's 15 minutes if they end up just blabbing and won't shut up. In this time, it's good to look around, see what there is. Uh, we've oftentimes spotted weapons. Most of the time, they're not even hiding it from us. They'll just be out in plain sight. Uh, I have been in houses that have do literally dozens of weapons everywhere, and they don't even say anything about them, and it's kind of weird. Uh, and yes, you could I could have been killed on the spot. <laughs> so it's understandable if you back out at that point, but maybe they're just a licensed gun owner or something. So looking around for other rooms, seeing if other doors are open or shut, seeing if anyone else is there. Maybe it's a family member uh, or maybe it's someone that's there to grab you, who knows? But I can't give much safety advice. We basically just try and survey the area, see if it's reasonable, uh, see if anything just feels off. If there's ever an off feeling, just don't go. Uh, your mind is really good at picking up those little subliminal messages without you even realizing it when you get that eerie feeling, like that feeling of someone looking behind you in the dark or something. Most likely your body was picking up little senses, like it heard a twig crack, but you didn't actually notice. It was just your mind dealing with it for you. Uh, basically, instincts are very good for Craigslist and use them to your advantage. If there's just this bizarre feeling, take it. But then again, as someone with extreme anxiety, who is aware that our instincts are kind of messed up, everything feels like that. So I unfortunately had to ignore that feeling because I got it in every single house uh, when it was actually fine. Also, another weird house thing, a lot of people don't want to give you their address until you're like 10 minutes away. So they'll be like, okay, it's in this city, let me know once you're in the city, then I'll give you the address. Most of the time they say this is for their own protection. Uh, some people have basically had very valuable stuff, very expensive cars, lots of tech, or certain things where they're afraid that a burglar or a robber might be trying to kind of figure out the house. Uh, so they want you to be close first. I think this is just trying to make themselves feel better because there's very easy ways to get around this. Literally just typing, hey, I'm 10 minutes away. What's the exact address? You don't have to leave. I could do that. I could send a message to someone right now saying I'm 10 minutes away. It doesn't make a difference. But anyway, people might ask you to do that. Uh, we've never had a problem with that, but safety, is not my thing, disclaimer, I don't know. I, that's just what we do. Then picking a location, like I said, uh, if it's in between you or something, there's nothing wrong with doing it at a police location or at a, I don't know, a firehouse. You don't do it at a firehouse because like the fire engine might have to drive out and then it'll be in the way. But normally we do Starbucks and Walmart. It's just our, <laughs> our, our two. Um, and then we just do it outside in front of obvious cameras and stuff. So cameras won't save you if you're being mugged, but the likelihood of it happening is lower. Next, I'll talk about what to ask them in person, what to look for on the animal. But before that, I wanna give you some tips on if you're gonna be late, because this is what would always happen to me. I never keep track of time. I'm always pushing too many things in a one day and I'm always running behind. Um, I've run behind two to three hours late but I'm able to talk my way out of it so that they don't leave. Sometimes people have appointments they have to get to, but if they're clearly just don't wanna have to wait or don't wanna be there at a certain time just because they don't want to, then that's when I kind of take advantage of that a little bit more and use some different little texting tactics. Let's say the meetup's at 12 at noon and they live 20 minutes away and you live an hour away. You need to make it sound like none of this is your fault but at the same time, you're taking responsibility so that they feel like you're doing everything you can, even though it's out of your hands, when in reality, it's 100% your fault and you don't really care. You just want to convince them that you care. Let's say you are running an hour behind schedule and you're actually going to get there at 1, they think you're getting there at 12. The goal is to kind of convince them that you're going to be on time until they start to leave, because most likely they won't turn around if they've already left. <laughs> but give them a little heads up. Be like, okay, I just left. I'm on the way. Unfortunately, the GPS is actually saying it's going to be uh, 1225 instead of 12. So sorry about this, but I must have searched wrong last time and I'm actually going to be 25 minutes late. Uh, it sounds super nice. It's, it's like you tried your best. You're aware that it's your fault, but also you really still want to get the animal. Also, even though I'm getting there at one, I say 1225. Um, <laughs> I try to say numbers a little bit below. I try to reverse exaggerate. Like, I don't want to say 1230 because that's uh, that's a half hour. But 1225, okay, that's 20 something minutes. I can, I can wait 20 minutes. But waiting a half hour for someone sounds bad. So I'd be like, all right, I'm getting there at 1225. If they're like, okay, no problem. I'll leave later. 
then you'll be like, great, thank you so much. And uh, you'll actually still be 35 minutes later than that, but they don't know that yet. Okay, so you're driving along, and uh, once it hits around 12, 18 or something, this is when I send my next text. This time, it's traffic's fault. That darn traffic, it just, it just came out of nowhere. Text them, be like, hey, so still on the way, um, making good progress. Unfortunately, I think there's an accident or something. This traffic is awful and I am barely moving and I am so sorry. I want this animal so badly, but I'm completely wasting your time. I'm going there as fast as I can. If you could wait, that would be amazing. So, and they'll be like, okay, uh, well, what's the GPS saying now? And I don't say a time this time. This time I actually tell them how many minutes. This time I want to get the idea across that it's actually going to be 1245 instead of 1225. So you'll be like, uh, it looks like about 20, 25 minutes. And they'll be like, okay, um, well, I've already left, so I'm not going to turn around. Whatever, I can wait 20, 25 minutes. Uh, and you're going to be stuck in traffic, but actually just speeding down the road <laughs> because you didn't pay attention to time and you're doing your best to get there on time but actually you're still 15 minutes off of when they expect you to be there they think you're getting there at 12 45 and uh it's actually gonna be one so, so let's say at 12 46 to 12 47 there'll be like obviously you're not gonna be right on the dot and then actually you're like 18 minutes away because you took a little longer still than you expected. So your third text is going to be like, this is so embarrassing. I just took the wrong exit. Um, it's rerouting. I'm, I'm, I'm just two exits down. I'm almost there. This is awful. This is embarrassing. This completely sucks. And then you just want to sound defeated and angry and agitated so that they feel like they need to comfort you and be like, oh yeah, no, it's no problem, I understand. I've done the same thing, just let me know when you're around the corner and uh, what car you're in or whatever. And <laughs> you'll be like, okay, thank you so much. This is haha <laughs> awkward, ooh, I don't know. I make this so complicated, you could just be honest. But still, we're not done because, again, they think you're getting there at 1245, it's 12.47 now, you still have 15 minutes to go. Wrong exits don't usually take 15 minutes to make up, it might be like 5 to 10 minutes. And so the final recommendation I have is at 12.57, they might be like, where are you? And if they don't say that, then maybe you do it for them. You're three minutes away, you're flooring it, you're almost there. Okay, final text. I can literally see the Walmart, but I am stuck at this stupid intersection this is the longest light i've ever been at and it's the, one of those like yellow blinking yields that i can't get through and there's so much traffic coming i can see i think i see your car at walmart i am literally almost there i'm just stuck at this intersection that gives you about another three minutes to to take your sweet time hopefully you weren't texting and driving while doing this this can be the person that's driving with you or riding with you uh, that's doing all this interaction so that's how you make up if you're late because then you have that extra three minutes you pull up at one, and it's actually 1.03 because you were still a lot later than you expected. They've been sitting in their car for 44 minutes waiting for you. They wasted an extra 20 because they sat at home waiting for you. And for that reason, you have to look like this was a complete mistake and you're really upset. So you drive up really fast, you park really fast, you get out as quickly as possible. You're kind of like all over the place um, and don't look like you're about to attack them or pull a gun on them. Just look like you're in a rush. And then immediately, before they can say anything, be like, I'm so sorry I took so long. This was awful, ah, uh, because you don't want them to be angry at you. So that's my recommendation if you're completely late. Now, we're here. Let's calm down. If you're like me, you're freaking out, your heart's at 140 beats per minute because you have to talk to somebody. Now, they pull out the animal of their car. Here's some things you wanna do when you see the animal. First off, if it's something you can handle in that location, uh, actually handle it in front of them um, before they leave and do not give them the money yet. What I do is I make it obvious the money's in my hand if I'm paying them in cash, because most often they're gonna want cash. Um, and if in case I forget saying this later, don't negotiate after the fact because you quote, forgot the money. If you were gonna pay them $60, but you forgot a 20, forgot, don't do that. That's over the line, in my opinion. That's where you cross the negotiation line because um, that's a stupid scam that people do, and I don't recommend that. But make it obvious you have the money, but first ask to hold the animal. 
uh, when you're holding the animal, see if it's similar to the pictures and uh, make sure it's what you expected. Make sure it's the right animal, make sure it wasn't a fake image, make sure it wasn't something else. Make sure it's the temperament you expected, but keep in mind that it was just in a car and the temperament might be different. So if it's a little agitated, if it's hissing or biting, this could very easily be because it was in a car um, and it just got kind of bumped, like bumped around. But for a Lechberg gecko as an example, see if the tail is nice and thick and healthy. See if there's calcium sacs in the armpits. I wish you to see these big bubbles. They're not dangerous, but it gives you an idea that the owner wasn't really paying attention. And you can even get an idea of the smell. It might smell strongly of something. Personally, I've smelled everything I can. I don't know what most smoke smells like. I know what tobacco smells like, obviously, but based on like Googling what crack smells like, I'm 90% sure I've smelled crack on animals. <laughs> so there's that. And then uh, just weird fragrances, weird laundry detergents, weed, whatever. There's gonna be all sorts of smells. But if you smell crack or cigarettes on an animal, there's a likely chance the animal's been affected by it. And it might be stuck with a permanent wheeze uh, which is very common with tobacco, we noticed. Uh, not that you shouldn't get it, but it's just something to keep in mind because you have not bought the animal yet. Just because you showed up, even if you both drove five hours, you have no obligation to give them the money for the animal if it's not what you expected. You can refuse this at any time and leave. It would be very awkward too, and we kind of, we've only done that when an animal ended up being dead. Uh, we didn't know it was dead. I talked about this in the other video. It was a corn snake. We just looked at it in the container. They left it in their car in the summer. It was like 90 degrees that day, so the car was probably like 120. The corn snake fried, we bought it, they went back to work. We had to go back and get them to come back out of their office and give us our money back. So that's why you wanna actually take it out and make sure it's okay. And if it's what you expected, then you can hand over the money. Personally, I asked them to count it because I'm really bad at adding it up right, and I often give people the wrong amount of money <laughs> just because I don't add it right. So once I did that by accident a few times, I would be like, feel free to count it, uh, just to be transparent about it. Uh, sometimes people will have you pay by PayPal or something, uh, which is fine. It's not dangerous, it's not risky, as long as they're still trustworthy as far as you can tell. Um, I wouldn't pay someone by check. That's probably the only one I wouldn't do. But you could do Venmo. Um, don't give them your credit card, I don't know. Basic stuff you can figure out. Bring your own tub though, uh, even if they have something to carry it in. Bring one of your own because something might be unsecure. Uh, like if it's a leopard gecko and they give you a tub and the lid just pops off really easily, uh, you're gonna lose a gecko in your car. So bring your own sturdy container, even if they say they're bringing one. Also the container might smell like whatever that smell was, uh, or might be super gross or dirty, or something you don't want in your car. So in that case, you let them leave first, and then you throw that tub away when you're not looking, and then you put it in your own tub or snake bag or something. For snakes, if you don't have a snake bag, you can just use a pillowcase or a container as well. Also, you can check the sex of the animal if you wanna make sure it's the right sex. Uh, I have a video, for example, on how to sex leopard geckos. It's super easy and it's visual. I wouldn't like sex a ball python in front of them because you're gonna have to pop their cloaca and it might look like you're doing something bad and you don't want them to think that you're not reliable in that way. So yeah, there's that. <laughs> just do obvious visual things. Don't stick your fingers in all their holes because the person might be a little weirded out and not sell their animal to you. And then once you're ready to go, personally, because a lot of people recognize me, uh, it's important to make sure they're not following me, which I have not had happen. But some good ways to avoid this is if you have to run any errands, run the errands before going back home because if they're following you um, and you go to Target, they'll probably stop following you because it'll be obvious. Do the classic, like if you think they're following you, do four turn four lefts or whatever, because if you turn four lefts or four rights, uh, then you went in a circle and they're obviously following you, then you can call the police. Uh, I never had to do that. I've never had anyone follow me, but uh, re remember that it's not over till they're truly out of sight. But again, scam wise, most people scam and do risky things like this when it's like really expensive things for really good deals. If you see some really cheap tech and it's actually genuine, most likely it's stolen tech and they uh, just stole it and then sell it on Craigslist. Also, obviously something might be broken, but even if it's maybe a thousand dollar iPhone and it truly is, it's a perfect iPhone, you buy it for a hundred bucks, uh, maybe it was just a way for them to kind of find you and then follow you. But reptiles, I don't think most people would sell a leopard gecko as a way to be a predator to someone, but I'm sure someone's done it out there, so might as well take the same precaution. Preca preca precaution. And then if you do have questions, don't be afraid to contact them afterwards. 
Uh, worst thing that'll happen is they ignore you or tell them to stop contacting you. So those are all of the main tips. There's plenty more I could share about Craigslist. Maybe I could do a second part where I talk about more tips and tricks and random things, but those are all the basics of buying a reptile on Craigslist. Hopefully you learned something. If you did, then good. If not, then sorry you just wasted all this time. And whoops, my, my camera battery went out, but thankfully I was already done. So thanks so much for watching. This was a pretty long video, but I wanted to lay it all out there with everything that I've learned from doing over 100 Craigslist pickups. Weird flex, I know, but I don't know. I wanted to share. Hopefully it helped you out. Let me know if you find any cool stuff on Craigslist. Let me know if you get mugged on Craigslist. Not my responsibility. Like I said, disclaimer. Uh, I forgot what the disclaimer was. Uh, check out other videos if you want. I have like other reptile videos so. <laughs> thanks for watching <laughs> bye <laughs> bye